Good morning and welcome. Please be seated. Welcome to Burbank First United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Sam, the senior pastor of this church, and I want to welcome all of you on this Sunday after Easter Sunday and those of you who were here last week. You might be wondering, where did all the red carpet and stanchions go? Don't worry, you didn't do anything wrong. It's just that it takes a lot of work, and Easter is really, really special, and we did a lot of wonderful things last week. It's so special that I even wore a robe last week. You know it's special when this pastor wears a robe. But regardless, I thank you because typically the Sunday after Easter is one of the lowest attended Sundays of the year. But you are here. And all of you watching, you are here with us on Facebook Live or on YouTube, and I'm thankful that you allow us into your homes, and all of you here in person, always delightful to be in community and in worship with you. We have a wonderful hour of time together this morning. We are launching a new series. You're going to hear more about it while Pastor Elisha sets you up today with that series, and I really think it's going to bring us together together. It's going to be very thought-provoking and draw us closer to God and to one another. And that's what today is all about. I trust and I hope that we are going to just draw closer to God. And when we are closer to God, there is more grace and beauty and love. So let's begin by doing that. I will step us into today's scripture. So let's uh, look to the screen. We're going to look at a passage from Deuteronomy during which Moses is speaking to the Israelites. Deuteronomy 30, starting from verse 15, where he says, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall certainly perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? Dear God of heaven and earth, Lord of all people, of all places and of all seasons. We gather in this time, this season of Easter, during which we celebrate the resurrected one, the one who comes to offer life eternal. At the same time, we come, finding in ourselves some faults and our flaws, but we come here knowing that we are forgiven and embraced. We come living this life that often feels so finite and frail, but we come knowing that you offer us life that is enduring and eternal. We come feeling oh so human at times. We look at the world and the news lines that highlight how troubling life can be, but we come knowing that you call us to be holy. Holy doesn't mean perfect to you, God, but set apart as your people, your people that live treating each other with dignity, that live demonstrating service, that live grounded in your unconditional love. 
So wherever we are in our journey of life, as we come in this place, may we draw closer to you, knowing that we are forgiven, invited into holy and faithful lives. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. This time, we are going to receive a special song by our chantel choir. Beautiful music. It's good to have our choir in the house today. Looking forward to more music in the future. Good to see you here today and also those of you that are online. Glad to have you with us at the beginning of a brand new series today. We're doing a series called Half Truths. This series is based on a book that's written by Adam Hamilton. And for some of us on this journey, on this series, we're going to be stretched outside of our comfort zone because we're going to dive into some colloquial phrases, some words, some sentences that even you and I have probably said that we use in moments and events and in passing and as part of our Christian walk. We're going to investigate them today and going into the weeks forward to discover the half-truths that are behind them. Because as many of us know, most truths have some element of truth in them. In fact, on the back of Adam Hamilton's book, the way that the book is summarized at the very top is is very succinct. It says, 
They are simple phrases. They sound Christian, like something you might find in the Bible. They capture some element of truth, yet they miss the point in important ways. The Bible's a big book, right? It's a pretty big book. And so it, it, it's, it's kind of convenient to have like, you know, a pocket's worth full, a couple hip check phrases ready at the go. Because it's not like you're going to be able to whip out your Bible and be like, know every single verse and chapter. So having some phrases, some things that can kind of help you bump up against what you're supposed to do or say in certain moments, it's kind of helpful. It's kind of handy. In fact, a lot of these half-truths, one of the reasons we use them is because they help us avoid the hard work of explaining complex issues. Helps us not take on the burden of figuring certain things out at times. Sometimes we use these half-truths as an effort to support our prejudices or our biases. Sometimes we just hope they give us good luck. Now, I know our belief systems, they, they interact and they affect the way that we live. And so understand that if you have a tradition of, of using some of these, I'm not trying to upset you. Um, I'm trying to help us investigate these so we can see the way that we live our lives. For example, um, one of the things I think is interesting is, is New Year's rituals. Um, there's all, I don't know if you've, any of you have ever practiced a New Year's ritual. But these belief systems that kind of help you feel like you're going to have a, a good year moving forward. One of the oddest beliefs that my mom had us do as children is she had us wash our hands in money. I know. I know. Okay. We grew up on a very humble, poor uh, means for a while. And I can remember... Sometime during the new year, there'd be a bowl with lots of change in it, with soap and water, and we were supposed to wash our hands in money, because the belief was that it was going to bring us money. We never washed our hands enough, apparently, (laughs) because it didn't work. Here's the thing, friends. When you practice belief systems that don't work over time, you get a feeling of disillusionment. All of a sudden, maybe you start looking back at the people who told you the stories or told you the beliefs, and you start to be like, man, you wasted my time. You made me believe in something I didn't really need. In fact, that's one of the issues with some of these half-truths, is that they can lead people to conclusions that are not only untrue about God or about your Christian walk, but it can actually push you away. It can make you go, I don't want anything to do with this. If that's what it is, I don't want, I don't, I don't want this. That's one of the dangers of half-truths. So even though they can be easier for us or help us go down the path for a little while, for example, maybe you've heard this one before. God helps those who helps themselves. It's a phrase that's been thrown out many times, perhaps you've heard it throughout your life. It's a phrase that you feel like, man, that has to be in the Bible. It's got to be there. But it's not. It's not in there. But yet we throw these phrases out. And what happens when you believe that over time? And if that's not true, and you're trying to live your life based on a half-truth, and you get half-deceived, and you feel that hurt later on in your life, or in certain events and certain times in your life. And we're going to talk about that even more here in a a minute. The thing is, these half-truths, they're so powerful. They're so easy to do. They come, they come in r- really strong because you can support most of these half-truths with Scripture. You can take a Scripture, interpret it, talk about it in a certain way, and you go, that kind of makes sense. You know, spare the rod, spoil the child. Proverbs 13, 24. But is that used to justify child abuse at times? Probably. When I was in kindergarten, I had ADHD as a kid. Looking back, it probably had a lot to do with the dysfunction of my family and the domestic violence I saw from a very young age. If you track the two together, they go go together a lot. So I acted out quite a lot as a young child and when I was in kindergarten. And and at the private school that I was at then, I was only there for a year because I got kicked out. (laughs) Um, It was a private Christian school. 
I, the principal told my mom, spare the rod, spoil the child, that, I, that she needed to, to straighten me out. She proceeded to beat my butt for like two years straight. She will tell you that there were days that she just beat me because she thought it was a good idea. It got to the point where if I did something wrong, I would turn myself in and get ready for the beating. So did it straighten me out? Sure. I started to behave really well by the time I was in second and third grade. I was a very good boy by then. But you better believe I've had some conversations about some of those moments in my therapy. This idea that some of those beatings were justified by a belief system that God thought I needed to be straightened out and my mom used that. There is nothing in scripture that would ever support the idea of abusing a child and instilling unhealthy fear in a child. There's nothing in scripture that would ever support that. In fact, Jesus would always welcome the children and want to protect them, not to bring harm to them. And so when we practice these half-truths, it actually has impacts on lives. It affects them for a long time. And so we're going to be talking about them throughout the next coming weeks, investigating them. And today we're going to look at a big one, one of my favorites, because this is one that my mom's used, that my dad has used, that I've heard my sister say. And it's this one, and I bet many of you have said it yourselves. Everything happens for a reason. That phrase is it's not found in Scripture. There are many phrases that are found in Scripture that indicate to a plan or to sovereignty or to the uh, providence of God. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But this phrase, everything happens for a reason, is one that's been thrown out quite a lot in the Christian circles. And I can remember hearing it during times when certain people pass away in my life, or when accidents or tragedies would happen in my life, or when people would get laid off. This is one of those times that a statement would be used in trying to infuse a relief into a tense, stressful situation, trying to give it meaning, trying to instill hope that somehow, someday, this will make sense. The passage that we talked about today, when we read it, In Deuteronomy, this is one of the main places that some of this comes from. And it says here, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and rules, then you shall live and multiply. Just notice from the very beginning the way it's set up. It's kind of set up in a cause and effect way, isn't it? Life, good, death, evil, if, then. You can kind of see what Moses is doing with the people of Israel as he's moving through this. And he even continues, but if your heart turns away, here's the other condition, you will not hear but are drawn away to worship other gods. I declare that you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not. There it is again, a cause, effect, but if, then. The next part of the passage, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life, death, blessing, curse. It almost seems like we have this dualistic dichotomy of cause, effect, cause, effect. And so it's very easy to just assume everything happens for a reason. Life, death, blessing, curse, obey, disobey, if, then, but if this, then this. And so when we have this cause and effect idea in our head, it's very easy to think that not only does everything happen for a reason, but that something divine is behind it. Somehow, some kind of governance of God is a part of it. Like there's a, there's a, there's a link between our activity and what is happening and what God is doing in our world. But when we say everything happens for a reason, what we're really doing is alleviating ourselves of some of the hardest issues that people face in their lives. Think about the times that you've heard it in your life or that you've said it. I can remember one of the times I heard it, and it was said to my mom uh, by one of my sisters. And it was after my stepdad died from cancer. 
or I'm not sure if it was cancer. To be honest, we're not 100% sure because he battled cancer for years, years. And my mom took care of him, was his caretaker for years. And he deteriorated and withered down and got so skinny that he was just like skin and bones. And he did so much treatment, radiation, all of it. And then he got a clean bill of health, cancer-free. He did it cancer-free. He had a stoma bag. He had, he had, I mean, but he was, it's a different quality of life, but he was cancer-free. Finally, they were able to hopefully start getting back on their feet and moving forward. He died a week later. Don't know why. No idea. Don't know why he died. But to go on a journey of taking care of this man over years and the exhaustion that it takes to be a caretaker and go through cancer, and colon cancer with someone, and then they finally get that clean bill of health, whoo, and then within a week, bam, gone. And then to have someone say, man, everything must happen for a reason. It's not that there isn't a cause and effect in this world. Yes, we can explain everything if we could understand every scientific phenomena. Yes, there is cause and effect for everything. But that statement is more for us to alleviate us to not be on that journey of grief with someone in some of the hardest moments because we know that 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 grief is going to last. And so oftentimes we use this statement, everything happens for a reason, Because we can't explain why on earth would you get a clean bill of health from cancer after battling and then die a week later? And we don't know why. But for my mom to hear that, and perhaps when you've heard that, it might bring you a little bit of comfort for a brief moment. But I'll tell you what, when I've heard that in my life, in my moments, and the things that I've experienced, it has not helped. In fact, it has hurt quite a lot. And let's talk about the reasons why it hurts quite a lot and why it's difficult. Does everything happen for a reason? If we're going to talk about does everything happen for a reason, we have to look at a few problems. One is the problem of personal responsibility. If everything happens for a reason, and I mean everything happening for a reason, then I can be alleviated from personal responsibility, especially if you believe that when it comes to somebody's time to die, right? If everything happens for a reason, including the time that you die, if that was part of the plan, if if there's a reason for that, and there's a time for that, and everything happens for a reason according to a divine cause and effect system, then if I drink and drive and I kill a whole family on the highway, it's not my fault. It's supposed to happen for a reason. If I lose my temper and, and beat my child until they have a concussion, it's not my fault. It must have happened for a reason. If somebody does something terrible to you personally and you suffered greatly, stole something from you, hurt you, harmed you, abused you, must have happened for a reason. And it absolves that person from personal responsibility of the harm that was caused against you. I don't see anybody smiling. How come? (laughs) It doesn't feel very good, does it? The idea that there's no personal responsibility. If absolutely everything happens for a reason, and and it's going to happen that way, and it had to happen that way for some kind of divine cause and effect system, if everything happens for for a reason, well, then how can I ever be personally held responsible for anything I do? But here's the other problem with this. Because we know that that's not true in Scripture. We also know there's another problem, the problem of God's responsibility. If everything happens for a reason, not only can I not be held accountable for everything, then God is held accountable for everything. 
for everything. So you see, you see the dichotomy there? If it's got to happen for a reason and God's in divine control and there's a divine cause and effect, I, have, I can't do anything about it. That means God's doing everything about it. So now God's responsible for me drinking and driving and murdering that fa- and killing that family in a car accident? So now God's responsible for the decision to kill millions of Jews in the Holocaust? So now God's responsible for Sandy Hook and children getting shot at schools? See, this everything happens for a reason thing. It doesn't create a very good image for either ourselves personally or for the God that you choose to want to follow and believe in. It creates a lot of tension there, doesn't it? And it's that word, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. It leads to another problem, as you can imagine, the problem of fatalism and indifference. Imagine trying to really, really practice the belief and the half-truth that everything happens for a reason. When you eventually get to the place where you're like, none of it matters. None of it matters. Just do whatever you want. I don't know. I don't care. Just whatever. I mean, it's all going to happen anyways. Why go to the doctor? God's going to have me die whenever I'm going to die. Why go work out? Why try to stay healthy? Why try the new diet? Because my, you know, everything's going to happen for a reason. God's the one that's in control. Like if my time, sar- time card's already punched, then you know, who am I to get in the way of the plan? I'm just going to, you know, float along here and be along for the ride, right? But that doesn't sound like the call in Scripture that God has given us. It doesn't sound like it at all. In fact, let's go back to it. Let's think about this call that Moses gave to the people of Israel as Moses and God are trying to establish the relationship and the boundaries of this relationship and what it's supposed to look like. Hear what Moses says. Hear this pitch. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. Did it seem like Moses thought they had a chance? Yes. The man thought they had a chance. He said, therefore choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him, for he is your life and the length of days. It doesn't seem like Moses thought everything happened for a reason. In fact, it seemed like Moses was compelling the people of Israel saying, I have set before you the way of life and death. There's a way to have a good quality of life and a harmful quality of life. And I'm telling you that you have the power to choose yourself. So choose wisely. This thing that Moses is talking about, this whole thing that we're talking about this morning is divine providence and sovereignty. This half-truth, it gets into a systematic theology that we actually do talk about in theology, in seminary, when Pastor Sam and I, when we went and we trained, we talk about divine providence, about sovereignty, about these issues. Divine providence and sovereignty is about God's governance of and interaction with the cosmos and our lives. So how does the cosmos run? Is God controlling it all? Did God set it in motion? How, How does it go... Divine providence is the provision of God making the universe possible and then how God decides to interact with that created universe. And that includes our very lives. That's what we're talking about today. That's the big issue. And so when we talk about everything happening for a reason, yes, there's cause and effect in the world. But when we talk about divine providence, there's contrasting views. And so I want to share with you a few of the contrasting views. I'm not going to talk about them in detail, but I just want you to know how in history and how presently some people, some uh, theologians, some branches of Christianity are tackling this idea of divine providence because there are big questions that have to be answered. This half-truth of everything happening for a reason, which is an easy colloquial answer to some tragedies, the things that help us go just, we punt, we punt it to God and say, God, you'll figure it out for us, right? These types of divine providence views help explain that in the best way that they can. And first, 
is Calvinism and determinism. So hear me out, friends. And I want you to look at me very seriously. While I don't like the statement, everything happens for a reason, you can't find it in Scripture. There is a view in Christianity that's been around for a long time, Calvinism and determinism, that does believe and practice with scriptural evidence and support that God meticulously controls all things. All things. I mean everything. Including your decision to come to church today. Including the clothes that you're wearing right now. Including the food that you decided to eat this morning or the coffee that you drank. I mean everything. So there is a view in Christianity that genuinely does believe that God causes everything to happen in a preordained way. Now, that is a hard pill for many people to swallow because that does mean that somehow, some way, the atrocities of human history are part of God's plan. It also means somehow, some way, God has preordained some to eternity in heaven and some to eternity in hell. Now, this view has been around for a long time. It has been supported by Scripture and debated for a long time. And it is a viable view that I will say can be supported and argued in Scripture. It is not one that I personally practice out of the ones that I'm going to be talking to you today. But it is viable. And I knew great, wonderful Christians who were expanding the kingdom of God and spreading the love of Jesus with this view. But they did it in a way where they at least acknowledged it's a hard pill to swallow. If you're going to practice this view, you've got to at least be honest about that giant pill. Because trying to believe that all child suffering, all rape, all murder, all domestic violence, all illness, all, everything is planned meticulously by God to someday reveal the glory of God is a hard pill to swallow. But if you're willing to at least wrestle with it, then I will stand with you alongside you as your brother and sister and say, I can't tell you that you're wrong. Because I don't know the answer to all these questions. I just know how to approach them in different ways. So that is one way. Another way is deism and the hands-off God. This was something that was practiced pretty early on in the, coloniza the colonialization of the United States. Some of our early uh, Christian brothers and sisters really like this view. It's the idea that there is a divine God who out of nothing created absolutely everything, basically fine-tuned the universe, set up gravity, magnetism, protons, electrons, how everything was going to work, hit the start button, went boom, and then said, go. And then just stepped back, went hands off, and now just observes and watches in, with pleasure at what is happening before us. So it's a hands-off approach where God set everything up and then let humanity and creation kind of like just run the show. You know, we're just kind of running the show, doing our own thing. Now, there, there has been support and, and argumentation for that in Scripture as well. The other, another view is open theism and human dominion. It's the idea that the future is partly open, partly closed. I know that's a little bit confusing. Uh, but the idea is that God knows what God is going to do. God said, I'm going to send my son. I'm going to make an atonement. I'm going to create a new covenant. We see that God fulfills God's promises. God said, I'm going to return. I'm going to set things straight. There's going to be a redemption of all things. We look forward to that. Those are going to be within God's control. But open theism also practices that God has gifted us free will so that we become co-heirs with Christ. We become co-creators in shaping the world. God does interact. God is trying to move history. But it's in a way where we're more partners and the future is partly open, partly closed. Because God says, I'm going to do this and I want to see how you're also going to partner with me in how this plays out. And human determinism is the idea, human domain is, goes back to uh, Genesis with uh, God establishing a, a, a rule, an authority, and giving humanity domain over all of creation, saying, this is yours, uh, take care of it, steward it, name it, bless it, cultivate it, multiply it. And so it's the idea that we have stewardship over everything that's been made, and it's our job to make it even better if we can. Um, so those are the views of divine providence, and there's more. I could talk to you about more. I know. I know. Imagine trying to write lots of essays on this stuff, folks. Okay? It, it's, it, it gets mind-boggling at times. But here's the number one thing I want you to realize about these things. None of them, not one of them, 
ever takes the idea of divine providence or everything happening for a reason lightly. None of them do. Absolutely none of them do. Because the questions are too big. The events in our lives are too strong. The amount of human suffering in this world is too much. And so we have to be willing to investigate some of these truths. And so I'm going to challenge you that unless you're willing to practice a meticulous view of God's divine control over the entire universe, don't ever use that statement. I know. A little challenging, isn't it? A little challenging. Because what happens when we use that statement and it's only half true is that we're going to lead people to different conclusions about God that are untrue and that can affect their relationship and their experience in their relationship with God. Or it might affect the way that they treat their children or handle a, a, a trauma. We don't want to lead people into fatalism or into indifference. We don't want to do that. What we can say instead in moments of tragedy is that is awful. God is with you. I am with you. That's what we can say. We don't have to say everything happens for a reason. We can say that's awful. I am with you. God is with you. God mourns with you. I mourn with you. That's what we can say. And when we see tragedies happen on television, where another school shooting, another mass shooting, we don't have to say, well, everything must happen for a reason. We can say, that's awful. That needs to change. And we can do something about it. We don't have to punt when things are overwhelming. We don't have to punt when things are unexplainable. What we do have to do is practice our faith and trust in God and join together as the family of God. And when we do that, we shine the glory of God most brightly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. And God, I thank you that you can help us uh, set some things straight. Help us wrestle with some phrases and some beliefs that perhaps have uh, hooked us in our own life and things that we've set in practice. God, we know that your mercy is great and that you offer forgiveness for when we get it wrong or when we um, don't practice our, our faith uh, the best. Thank you for your grace and your patience. And God, help us to be sensitive uh, to the moments where this phrase was used in the past and help us to be more present, more grounded, and more comfortable in the unknown, but also in the trust that we can have in you in those moments. God, we love you. We praise you. And we look forward to continuing to discover more of your truth that will not only set us free, but guide our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. very much. Just a few announcements before we send you forth. First off, uh, the 
chancel area here is brightened up by some flowers and they have been given by Chris and Diane Dixon with happy birthday wishes to their grandson, Chris Mulcrone, for his ninth birthday. So thank you to the Dixons for bringing that celebration into our community. Uh, another announcement, and this follows our time of worship here. So shortly after today's service, if you are new, if you are getting to know this community and you want to learn more about who we are and what we're all about, you're invited to come out for what we're calling First Conversations with our pastors. And we're calling it First Conversations because the extent in which you converse with myself and Pastor Elisha is basically, you walk out those double doors, we have that greeting time, and then if you like the service, you say, nice sermon, nice service, Pastor, and then you leave, and that's it. And if you didn't like the sermon, you, you just look me in the eyes and you leave, and that's it. Uh, we want to give you more opportunity to converse with us, get to know us at a personal level. So you're invited to come today. We're going to share some stories. We're going to have some icebreakers. Bring your refreshments and snacks over from Trevor Hall into Stamper Lounge, which is right next door. And I really think you're going to learn some new things about us. For example, how many of you knew, uh, have known that in college I almost got expelled? Are you judging me? Are you judging me? Um, in our first conversations, you will learn why I almost got expelled and other exciting stories by Pastor Elisha and myself. So all are welcome to that time um, to get to know us. And uh, let's see here, another announcement. So we have this group called the UWF, the United Women in Faith. They are women who, who get together to practice, practice their spiritual formation together, to be in community together, and to do ministry together. If you want to support their ministry, one way you can do so is by not cooking one evening and going to California Pizza Kitchen. It's just down the street on San Fernando on Monday, April 24th, so mark your calendar. And a portion of your proceeds will go help the UWF. Besides this, you can follow us on our website, BurbankFirstUMC.org. Everything that we do together in this time and during the week, our outreach and all the good things that we do with our, our children, our choir and our youth come from your giving. So if you give, you participate in our mission and our vision. This is one way you can give. Another way you can give is through text. A lot of you watching online, you have your phone next to you. You're probably looking at your phone during today's service, and that's okay. Uh, but one way you can give is through that text. You simply put that number into the phone number part, and in the body of the message, you just put Burbank first. One word, Burbank first, and that'll lead you to how you can give. And then um, our app, if there's an event that's coming up, it'll be on our app. That's one way you can follow us. And then lastly, here in person, I believe when we meet in person, something special happens. Our humanity uh, becomes more vital. And uh, one way you can give, there are two little offering plates on the way out. You can drop your offering into there. And we also have hello cards. If you have questions for me or for Pastor Elisha or for this community, simply put your contact information on there, drop it into the offering basket, and we want to be able to connect with you in a meaningful way as our follow-up. So that's all we have, and I'm going to invite Pastor Elisha just to send us forth with a benediction. So all are invited to stand before we come, and I hope you will we'll see you over in the Trevor Hall and even some of you in Stamper Lounge. All right. May you go out in truth. May you go out seeking truth, investigating some of the things that we've said in the past, but may you go out uh, challenging yourself to investigate when you have seen this use in the past. Lord bless you, Lord keep you, make his face to shine upon you, and give you grace, mercy, and courage as you go in your pursuit of the whole truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>